Well, it's so good to have all of you with us today. We're in the fourth and final part of this series, Elevate. Now, across this entire series, I've mentioned this group of people called the the Sons of Korah. The Sons of Korah um, have been connected to 11 of the Psalms in this collection of songs and poetry labeled Psalms. 11 of them uh, are attributed to them. And in this series, the last three parts, uh, we focused in on Psalm 84, one of the 11 that the Sons of Korah wrote. Now, I also mentioned all the way back into part two that the Sons of Korah had a Well, they have this dark family story. Do you have a dark family story? Probably, for the vast majority of us, somewhere in our past, there's not just one dark family story. There's multiple dark family stories that, at some level, in some capacity, get connected to us. Well, for the sons of Korah, their, their dark family story got written down and got passed down from generation to generation to generation. Oh, in fact, that dark family story is embedded into, well, the Old Testament portion of the Bible. And to understand their dark family story and, well, the impact to Psalm 84, we have to go back to kind of where the, well, their portion of the story started. You see, there was a guy named Jacob. And uh, what's fascinating about Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons became the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I mentioned in part three that Jacob's name uh, literally means deceiver, and that over a period of time, God actually changed Jacob's name from Jacob and called him Israel. And Israel became a nation out of well, his 12 sons who became the 12 tribes. One of the sons, one of the tribes, named Levi. Levi had three sons, and those three sons uh, were Gershon, Kohath, and uh, Moroni. Now, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing any of these names correctly, but hey, we'll, we'll go with that. And what's important about those three sons, those families as they grew, is God does something very specific within them. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now, Kohath had, um, well, two of his sons were named Amram and Izhar. And those names you have probably never heard before, but their sons you have heard before. You see, Amram had two sons, uh, Moses and Aaron. I told you, you've heard of them, especially. You've heard of Moses, the Ten Commandments, right? And Aaron was Moses' brother. Now, Izhar had three sons, but the one that we just want to highlight was a son named Korah. Right? The sons of Korah. Now, this Korah had sons, which we'll get to in a moment, but the sons of Korah that wrote Psalm 84, well, those sons were generationally later. We're talking decades and decades and decades later, but they're all connected to all well, this family lineage. Now, God does something very specific with Moses. And if you're familiar with the Exodus story, right, God comes to Moses in a burning bush, and he chooses Moses to be his leader out of everyone. He said, hey, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, Moses was reluctant, so he brings Aaron along with him. Aaron becomes his spokesperson, right? And that's the story. Well, Moses leads God's people out of captivity, and there these 12 loosely connected tribes start to become a nation, which eventually becomes Israel. Now Moses, if you follow the line, is a member of the tribe of Levi. So this is the tribe he's connected to. And as God is putting together this, again, this loosely connected group of 12 tribes into one nation, he's using Moses to do this. He's putting structure. And one of the first thing God does to put the structure together is he says to Moses, hey Moses, out of the 12 tribes, one tribe, Levi, I'm going to set apart. 
the tribe of Levi have something so specific. Their, their focus is going to be on serving me and serving the people of Israel. That the tribe of Levi was, was there to, to create a space to worship God and to create a space for all of Israel to worship God. That was so specific for that one tribe, the tribe of Levi. God went on and specifically started to break down responsibilities. And he told Moses, hey Moses, with the Marianites, um, that entire family, uh, they're responsible for the structure. Remember that, that the tabernacle is, is a tent-like structure, massive tent. And so the Marianites were responsible for all the well, the tent components, the poles, the bases, the stakes, the structure of it. And every time that, that tabernacle, that tent was taken down, they were responsible to transport that to the next location, the next camping spot. Now, the Gershonites, they were uh, responsible for the coverings of the tabernacle. Think about this, like the, the, the canvas or the cloth walls. All of those coverings, they were responsible for those. And again, they were responsible to take those down, set those up, and to transport them from place to place to place as God led the Israelites through the, well, the, wander, the wilderness wandering, the desert wandering. But the Kohathites, they were resp responsible for the sacred items, the Ark of the Covenant the altars, the lamps, the sacred items. And you can almost feel like that's kind of like an elevated responsibility, right? The, the, the other two families, the Marianites and the Gershonites, you know, they, they were just responsible for the tent. Now, the tent was massive, and it was an important responsibility, but the Kohathites, responsible for something so, the sacred items of God. And Moses and Aaron... And Korah, well, their, their grandfather was Kohath, right? That was their family lineage. But God wasn't done yet at dividing responsibility. God comes to Moses and says, hey, Moses, I want Aaron to be the priest. That's his responsibility. That's his job. And in fact... Only those coming from the lineage of Aaron can be priests. You talk about an even more elevated role. Now, over a short period of time, some tension arose between the cousins, between Korah and Moses and Aaron. The tension started, well, in a couple different Places. One of the places that the tension started was within Korah when all of a sudden he and those connected with him just became discontent with what they were, were uh, placing uh, uh, responsibility to do. You see, for the Marianites and the Gershonites, as they took down the, the coverings and the structures, they were allowed to place those items in, in like, let's call them wheelbarrows carts where they could push or oxen could pull them from place to place to place. But God stipulated that with the sacred things, they would have to carry them on their shoulders. And for Korah and well, his entire family connected to him with this responsibility, they were getting really aggravated of having to to carry the items from place to place to place. They were tired of putting them on their shoulders. They became discontent with what God had asked them to do. And then Korah looked to the left at, well, his cousins, and all of a sudden jealousy started to emerge because he couldn't understand why he had to carry things while Moses just told everyone what to do, and Aaron was the priest. You see, discontentment. I mean, this is true for Korah. It's true for you and I to this day. Discontentment. If we don't stop it, if we don't unroot it, will always turn into jealousy. Because our discontentment will cause us to look to the left and to the right 
about what other people have, what other people have received, their position, their house, their car, their kids, their family, their job, their passions, their gifting, right? Discontentment, if we don't uproot it, becomes well, becomes jealousy as we look to our left and to our right. And this is what happened with Korah. Jealousy started to erupt from within him and within those connected to him, right? It spreads like a virus. And then division happens. Division happened within Korah between him and Aaron and Moses again. I mean, this is not just a, a, a positional division. I mean, this is also family. They're cousins. I mean, this is close family. And division started to just erupt, not because of anything Moses or Aaron did, all because of the discontentment within Korah that led to jealousy that then divided relationally. And then Korah started to grab onto some other people and started to spread that division. And all of a sudden, a, a group of about 250 of them all were, well, leveraging accusations against Moses specifically and Aaron. That it was their own doing, that they made this all up, that they elevated themselves into the, this, this place of position and, and power and influence that was them themselves, not God, it was them that had chosen this whole framework, this whole leadership structure, and they started to, to spread that dissent amongst Israel. Well, Moses got a, a hold of this. He heard what was going on. He called everyone together and, and listened to well, what Moses said, specifically what God said through Moses. Moses said, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things. I mean, this whole structure, the tribe of Levi into the three separate families and their responsibilities all the way down to what Aaron is priest, right? This whole entire, this entire scenario. Moses is like, hey, you got to know, this is how you're going to know that, Lord, that God has sent me to do all these things and that it was not my idea. If these men die, <laughs> right, can you feel that? If these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But, he says, if the Lord brings about something totally new, and I tell you, this is not a good totally new, uh, and the earth opens up uh, its mouth and swallows them. Again, I told you it wasn't totally a good thing, <laughs> this totally new thing, with everything that uh, belongs to them, and they go down alive into the realm of the dead, then you'll know that these men have treated the Lord, and that's a key phrase. Moses didn't say treated me. Because Moses knew it had very little to do with him. It had everything to do with Korah and his contempt for God. And Moses says, then you will know. And as the story goes, we're told that immediately, immediately, right when Moses got done speaking, the earth opened up and swallowed up Korah those 250 and all those connected to him. He's wiped off the face of this earth. But then, there's one simple sentence, one simple statement that comes right after that. And God lets us know that Korah's sons, his direct sons, again, not the sons of Korah that we're talking about that wrote Psalm 84, I mean, this is generationally before. But his immediate sons didn't die. They weren't consumed by the earth opening up. Why? We're not sure. Maybe they were too young to, to be responsible for their own decisions. Or maybe they had separated themselves from their dad because they didn't agree with his sentiments. Either way, what we know is his sons didn't die. And then you don't hear much about Korah until the prophet Samuel emerges onto the pages of history. Samuel, the one that, that chose King Saul, the first king of Israel, and then who followed God's lead to 
pick David to be the king of Israel. And Samuel, his entire lineage goes through Korah. And then David becomes king. And he gathers around him the sons of Korah. Some of the most prolific songwriters, psalm poets that we have recorded for us. And understanding that, understanding their, their dark family history, their dark family story, remember, that story just wasn't forgotten. That story was written down. I mean, for the Jewish people, the, the first five books of the Bible the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is the core text. And the story of Korah is written down. Everyone read that story. The sons of Korah could never leave that story. And understanding their, well, their story history, think about it. Psalm 84. And as we bring this series to a close, reading the last few thoughts, I just want you to keep that story in the back of your mind. And they write, better. Better is one day in your courts, oh God, than a thousand elsewhere. One day, one day, in your presence, God, is better than a thousand anywhere else. One day with you, God, is better. I mean, you think about one of those like top five uh, moments that you've ever, uh, ever had in your life, and then multiply that by a thousand, right? They're saying, hey, just one day with you, God, is better than a thousand days anywhere else doing anything else. And not only is that one day better than anywhere else, they went on and they go, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I would rather stand there, guard, staring out for hours on end, close to you, God, than then, well, having a party with some of those people doing those things. I would rather just stand there Close to you, God, than doing anything else. And I think about that as they know their, their family story, their, their family history. That Korah was just so discontent with having to carry the sacred items instead of being honored to carry the sacred items. He was so jealous about what Aaron got to do and he lost sight of what God had asked him to do. And they said, hey, God, we'd rather stand there on guard as a doorkeeper, bored, just staring out, watching, to be close to you, to be close to your presence. That's, that's more important than anything else. For the Lord God is a son. It's an image of God guiding God is our sun and shield, is an image of God being our protector. The Lord bestows favor. He, he gives us his grace. And they would have fully understood the power of God's grace because God is a God who redeems what is broken, who puts back together the shrapnel of our lives. He takes dark family stories and in his hands he makes all things new again they fully understood God's favor and God's guidance and God's protection and God is the giver of his, his grace and his love no good thing does he withhold from those who walk is blameless, when you're walking with God, 
upright, not perfectly, because again, we need his favor, we need his grace, but when our pursuit is a life to worship God, to honor God, to follow God, to seek God, to walk in his footsteps, that's what walking blameless looks like. God won't with, withhold any good thing. And then they write, Lord Almighty, blessed, divine joy, happiness, is a one who trusts in you, who trusts in you, who placed their faith in you. You see, I think about these three pursuits that we've been talking about over this the course of this series, these three pursuits that I've challenged all of us. This isn't a how to accomplish your New Year's resolutions goals series. This is all about this constant spiritual desire, longing, yearning that infuses itself in every part of our lives. My prayer for all of us, me included, that that this series, that this psalm will guide us throughout all of 2024 and beyond, that every day we pursue, in every moment, in every interaction, with every breath, that we start with worship. That before we respond, before we reply, before we just, we glance up and we worship God. Before we make that financial decision, we look up and we start with worship. Before we decide to hit reply on that message, we just pause and we start with worship. As those thoughts come into our brain that aren't of God, that we pause and we start with worship. And then we fight fear with faith. And remember, it doesn't matter the quantity of our faith. It has everything to do, everything to do with who we place our faith in. And that's why starting with worship is so critical. Because when we place our faith in him, God, Yahweh, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere God. Now, our faith can move mountains, not because we're strong enough but because he is. And all of that leads to this third pursuit. we got to embrace dependence. Dependence in him. I mean, that's what they said at the very, very end. They're like, Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you, who depends on you, who says, hey, God, You got this. I don't. Hey, God, your strength is enough. Not my strength, your strength. So as I go, I'm going to grow in you. My dad would say to me over and over and over again, I can hear his voice to this day. He would look at me and say, son, let go, let God. Hey, son, let go, let God. I'd be dealing with a thing at school, let go, let God. I'd be struggling on the soccer field, let go, let God. I would be struggling with a a friendship, let go, let God. I'd be struggling with some insecurity, let go, let God. I just remember my dad over and over again saying to me, hey, hey son, you got to let go, let God. One of the most powerful things you can do when you start with worship is just to open your hands. There's something about this posture, this position. When you, when you pray, just, just open your hands. Unless you're driving and praying, then at least keep one hand on the wheel. One hand is good. Right? You can do it. With, but it's, there's something powerful, physically and spiritually. When you start with worship, when you have that conversation with God and you're just lifting your eyes up to him and you just open your hands and just say, hey, God, I'm not going to hold on. This is in your hands. Hey, God, I I don't know what to say, but you do. Hey, God, I don't know how to respond, but you do. Hey, God, I want to hold on to what is mine, but I realize that everything I have is really yours, so God, I'm just going to 
open my hands. I'm just, I'm letting go. It's yours. It's yours. It's the position of opening your hands to God in worship, in prayer, in conversation with him. I just tell you, something happens at the soul level when you're talking with God, and you could be yelling with God, you could be begging with God, you could be bartering with God, whatever that, just open your hands and say, God, I, I'm letting go of my desires. I'm letting go of my things. I'm letting go of my wants. I'm letting go of my reply. I'm letting go of my. God, I'm placing it in your hands. You see, one of the phrases I say all the time, I've been saying it more and more and more, it's a phrase, God is on the move. In fact, if you uh, looked at our annual report, and there's so many things to celebrate from 2023, I'm just telling you, right at the very beginning of my little letter I wrote, I wrote, God is on the move. Uh, If you gave uh, at any point uh, to Tri-County Church over 2023, you received a letter from me, or you you will be, uh, and Throughout that letter, it talks about how God is on the move. And here's what I know. God is moving. My question for you is this. Are you moving with him? That's what embrace dependence looks like. Say, God, I'm going to move with you as you go. I'm going to be in step with you. And I might not understand why you're doing what you're doing But my faith, whether it's big faith or itty bitty faith, my faith is in you. I trust you. And I'm going to embrace dependence. I'm going to keep my hands open to you. Trust you. I know you want what's best for me. I trust even in the valley, in the valley of Baca, You are with me. Embrace embrace dependence. God has you. Stop holding on. Let go. Let God. Right now, I was thinking about how to bring this series to a close, but also, I hope it doesn't Come to a close. My prayer is that these words will guide you spiritually over the course of 2024 and beyond. So right now, I just want to encourage you. Take your hands and just open them up in front of you. Just hold them open. And I want to read these words over you. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, longs, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, my entire being, they, they, they cry out, they shout out, they sing out for you, the, the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca, the valley of tears, the valley of the thirsty. They They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength. God, as I go, I grow stronger. Till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better, so much better, is one day in your courts than a thousand thousand anywhere else I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked for the Lord God is a son my guide and my shield my protector and the Lord bestows the Lord gives favor grace compassion his love and honor 
No good thing does he withhold for those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. He must become greater. And I, you, must become less. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, may we start with worship, with every breath, in every moment. Lord, as fear tries to control our lives, Lord, I pray that we understand that it's our faith in you, not quantity, but who we place our faith in that will drive out fear. And Lord, I pray that we'll embrace dependence on you, living our lives with open hands. Every time we want to close our hands, Lord, I just pray that either we choose to open our hands or you pry our fingers open. That everything we have is yours. And all that we need is in you. In your name we pray. Amen.